Hello, students. We are on lecture two, Roman culture and its legacy. So we're going to talk about some Roman culture stuff and how we still today do things that the Romans did back forever ago. They influenced our cult, our modern culture. So how? Well, Romans were really big on the arts. They did mosaics with glass, stone, and pottery. And I'm gonna tell you what mosaics are in a second. And they were really, really big on big paintings on walls, murals. They made murals of landscapes. That's just like nature. They did murals of popular myths. They did murals of famous people. We still have this right now. Think of when you're driving down Al Farabi and you look over and there's a big painting on the side of a building. That's a mural. The Romans did that forever ago. And statues of famous people and gods and heroes. So the, the Roman statues were a little different than the Greek statues. The Greeks made their statues, the person looked absolutely perfect. Like there wasn't anything wrong with them. Even if in reality, they didn't have the perfect body, their statue of them would have the perfect body. Everything was perfect about them. But the Romans, they did their statues more realistic. They, they made statues look actually like the person really looked. Mosaics are really cool. This is a mosaic. So see, they would take tiny, tiny, tiny little tiles of all different colors and make an art, art design, artistic design out of it. These are all mosaics. And let's go back. Okay. So, uh, ah, the Greeks also made lots of glass vases and jars, like just beautiful things to stick flowers in or whatever. That was really big for them, decoration around their homes. And mirrors, they didn't have like the kind of mirror that you think of now, they would take a piece of silver, like silver metal, and they would shine it, 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 until it was so shiny that you could see yourself in it. And they would hang it on the wall, just like we do. Probably, I assume, in your house, you have a mirror hanging on the wall so you can look at yourself the ancient Romans did that. They were also really big into jewelry. People wore lots and lots of beautiful jewelry. And we still do that today. All right. That was the arts. I'll write the arts over here. Now we're going to do language. So the Roman people, what language did they speak? Hopefully you remember it, they spoke Latin. So Latin was spread all over the, the, the Roman Empire, but they especially spoke it in the Western part. Like here's the, this is the Mediterranean Sea. And you know, the Roman Empire was all this land all along the Mediterranean. And if we were to just kind of draw a line here, the Western Roman Empire, they all really, really spoke Latin. As you got further east, sometimes they spoke different languages, more local languages for their area. But, but Latin spread all along here. And 
And th this part would be France and Italy and Spain. I know that's not what it really looks like, but like this, this part of the Roman Empire would be France, Spain, and Italy. So language changes. Um, it's difficult for me to think of it here. Maybe if you speak Russian, I bet the Russian here in Kazakhstan is a little bit different than the Russian they speak in Russia. Like I know when I lived in Benin, the French they speak in Africa is a little different than the French they speak in France. And English, people from England actually sound different than people from America. But we're both speaking English. We use slightly different words for things. And some words are very different. In, in American English, we say laboratory. But in British English, they say laboratory. Those are very different pronunciations. But so language changes a little bit. And as language gets further physically apart, geographically apart, it changes. And as time goes on, we are talking hundreds of years, thousands of years, it can change so much that you can't even call it the same language anymore. So that happened. Someone spoke Latin. No, well, let's say there are three people that speak Latin. And on a map, one person moves way over here. And another person moves way over here. And another person moves way over here. And over a long, 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 long time, their language that they're speaking has changed so much that you can't even call it Latin anymore. It's different. Well, that you can call that French. And then this person that moved over here over hundreds of years, their language has changed so much that you can't even call it Latin anymore, but you can call it Italian. And then the same thing, this person over here, go, their language has changed so much. It's not Latin anymore, it's Spanish. Even though they all started speaking the same language, they've moved to different parts of the world and their words and pronunciation have changed so much. You can't even call it Latin anymore. It's a new, totally new language. There's also Portuguese and Romanian lots and lots and lots of other languages. And the languages that originally came from Latin, they're called Romance languages. Any language that once upon a time, many, 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 many years ago, used to be Latin, now it's called a romance language. English is not a romance language. English does not come from Latin. Just in case you're curious, English is actually a Germanic language. Once upon a time, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, a long, long time ago, it was a German language. And it's changed so much. You can't even call it German anymore. Now it's English. But let's get back to the Romance languages. The Romance languages, the three that you should be the most familiar with 
are French, Italian, and Spanish. And they kind of sound alike. Like, I, my French is pretty good. I speak pretty decent French. And my Spanish is pretty good. I speak pretty decent Spanish. I have never had an Italian class in my life. But when I was in Italy, I did okay. Like people could kind of understand what I was saying. And I could kind of understand what they were saying because the languages are related enough that you can, if you know two or three romance languages, you can kind of understand the other ones because they all have the same, this is called a parent language. They all have the same parent language. Now, English, uh, English isn't on here. English has some words that come from Latin. The word educate, educate is a Latin word. The word labor, labor is a French word. And French comes from Latin. So these are romance language words. But overall, our language, the English language, is Germanic. OK, so now you know what the romance languages are. So let me erase all this stuff. <laughs> Okay, so we've covered the arts, we've covered language. Let's cover literature and science. Literature and science. The Romans developed this thing called oratory. Oratory is giving speeches. That's all it is. Giving a speech about whatever is oratory. It can be a persuasive speech. You are trying to convince someone of something. Uh, but giving a speech is the art of oratory. People used to gather around, they would memorize a speech, and they would stand in front of people and give it. In fact, right here at AIS, we have speech club. Oh, I almost said sheet club. We have speech club. And this is just people learning how to do a better job of speaking in public. Well, this was begun by the ancient Romans. And there was a very famous practitioner of oratory, and uh, his name was Cicero. Cicero was in the documentary that we watched. Do you remember the lawyer that uh, was defending someone and said, oh, I'm not even going to bother telling you about what a horrible person the other person's lawyer is. I'm not going to tell you what a terrible husband he was. I'm not going to tell you what a horrible father he was because I'm not here to talk to you about what a terrible person he was. I'm here to defend my client. And so what did he do? He made you already think that the other guy is a bad guy and wrong. That was Cicero, that kind of learning how to use your words to make people think what you want them to think. That was a really big thing in ancient Rome. And let's see here. Then we had some famous poets. This falls under literature. We had some famous poets. Virgil wrote the Enid, 
or the anid. Some people call it the anid and some people call it the enid. But uh, that was a guy named Virgil. This is an epic poem. This really, really long, like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, crazy long poem. And there was Horace. Horace wrote a collection of poems. called Odes. And Ovid wrote witty verses, like funny things. These names, these are really, really, really famous names. You should learn these names because you're gonna hear them over and over and over again as you live. And if you know these names, you just sound smart. People are gonna think you're smart. If you can sit around the dinner table and tell your parents that you were learning about Virgil and Horace and Ovid in your cultural studies class today, your parents are gonna be like, whoa, my kid's smart. So those are important names. Then, also under literature, satire was, satire was invented as a type of literature. And this guy, Juvenal, was a really famous satirist. Satire is a kind of writing that is used to make fun of your subject. The whole point of satire is to make fun of your subject. And Juvenal mostly wrote about the everyday Roman citizen. He did not have much respect for the everyday Roman citizen. He would write uh, poems and articles and books making fun of them and saying, uh, they're so stupid. They all they care about is getting free food and entertainment. He said they let these emperors do horrible things because the emperors give them free food and entertainment. They said we used to be a republic. The people used to care. The people used to vote for our leaders and we put into to leadership positions who we wanted. And now the Roman people just sit back and let these emperors rule, but because they're perfectly happy, they get entertainment and they get food and that's all they care about. And so he wrote these books making fun of them for that. That's satire when you're making fun of the subject that you're writing about. And now, philosophy is next. Let me get all this. Philosophy. Philosophy already existed, you know this, but the Romans had carried it, carried it on. They wrote more philosophy books. They dedicated more schools to philosophy. It became more developed. There was one famous Roman philosopher named Seneca and Seneca wrote about Stoicism. Stoicism is a philosophy about accepting suffering and controlling your emotions. Accepting suffering when your teacher tells you to do some assignment and you go, oh, I don't want to, Mrs. Gibbons. That is not accepting suffering. The Stoics 
the Stoics taught that everything in life is not going to be perfect. You are going to have to do things that you don't like, and you should just accept it and do it because it's going to happen. And they were all about controlling your emotions. When you feel upset about something, don't go, I'm mad. Or when you're upset because you don't want to do something that your teacher says, you don't go, I want to. Or when you're extremely happy about something, you don't jump up and down and get really, really excited. Just kind of, you know, you accept things. You didn't have to look all the time, completely emotionless, but kind of, you know, take it down a notch. When somebody tells you to do something you don't want to do, don't moan and complain about it. Just do it. Life, life happens. There's always going to be something you don't like. Just deal with it. That was the big thing of stoicism, was accepting that things that you don't like are going to happen and controlling your emotions, not looking like some fool in front of everybody, because acting like a fool because you don't want to do it. Just chill out and do what you're being asked to do. That's stoicism. All right, now we've got science and medicine. And there were a couple famous people from here we have to talk about. A famous scientist was Claudius Ptolemy. Yes, same, same name. He wrote a book called The Almagest. And The Almagest was an astronomy book that talked all about the stars. And people used this book. They based what they thought about the planets and the stars and like where the earth was in the universe and how the stars moved. People used this book for more than 1,200 years. 1,200 years they followed this book. Turns out it was all wrong. He was wrong. But he was still like considered, he was a really famous guy. I mean, they read his books for 1,200 years. And uh, he also wrote books on geography and optics. Optics is light. Like, how does light work? Where does light come from? If I'm in a dark room and I light a candle and it sends light out, how does that work? He wrote books about that. And then medicine, we had a different Claudius, very famous name back then, Claudius, Claudius Gallen. Claudius Gallen was a famous doctor and he did something really cool. He dissected animals. It was considered a kind of like creepy thing back then. People still didn't do it. Still today, some people are kind of creeped out by dissecting animals. But he dissected animals and found out all kinds of cool things about how the body works. And a big one that he discovered was that arteries and veins carried blood. People didn't know that before. People thought arteries and veins carried air. They knew they existed. They knew there were arteries, they knew there were veins, but they thought it was air that flowed through them. It was Claudius Gallen that, that discovered that it was blood that went through them. 
because he dissected an animal and cut open a vein and blood poured out of it. And his books that he wrote about medicine and the body, over a thousand years, people used these books. And all right, now we're moving on to sports. Sports. Uh, first off, the Romans invented the amphitheater. That's a huge, huge, huge theater that thousands of people could go to to watch some event. And they had gladiators. Now, gladiator in Latin, gladiator means swordsman. But gladiators didn't always fight with swords. They would fight with all kinds of weapons. And mostly gladiators were either criminals or slaves. And they were forced to fight to the death. Sometimes they would uh, bring in lions or elephants or other of these rare, anim scary animals, and they would make them fight the animal to the death. Now, if a gladiator, if one gladiator won a whole bunch of fights, he could eventually win his freedom. And sometimes they became really, really famous because they were sporting people. I'm sure you know the name of your favorite football player. That Just like that, just like someone that plays a sport is really famous today and you know their name, maybe you wear their jersey. They did the same thing back then. Really famous gladiators became, I mean, really good gladiators became really famous all over the Roman Empire. And uh, let's see here. Ah, the emperors and really, really rich uh, uh, people from the arist aristocratic class, they were the ones that would put on these gladiator events because they were really, they were doing it to show off their money. They would set up these huge lavish events to show off their money. The history of gladiators is kind of interesting. Gladiators were originally in the southern part. They were originally in southern Italy. And when a rich person died, they would put on gladiator events. And the gladiator that died was seen as a sacrifice in honor of this rich person that had died. But eventually everything changed and it wasn't about dead people at all anymore. It was just a sporting event for fun. Now, what can you think of? What kind of sport can you think of that happens today that is similar to gladiators? We've got boxing. People, hundreds and hundreds of people go into a room just to watch two guys fight each other. We've got wrestling, same thing. Uh, there's MMA, uh, karate, all kinds of those things. If, if you're paying money to go sit in a room to watch two guys fight each other, it's the same thing as gladiators. The only thing that's different is we don't fight to the death anymore. And then we had chariot races. Chariot races were, everyone would go in Rome, they were in Rome, and you would go to the Circus Maximus. The Circus Maximus was, so it was a building I'm gonna to have to go like the people, the people sat here. This is where the people sat. And inside there would be a track. And you would have charioteers. 
would race horses pulling their chariot all the way around the track seven times. And whoever gets there first wins. And this place was amazing. The Circus Maximus held 270,000 people. That's almost 300,000 people went to watch these guys doing their chariots running around in circles. And today we have car races. It's the same thing. People look at all these people in this crowd, loads and loads, hundreds of people go to watch guys drive cars around in a circle. It's the same thing as a chariot race. Let me say chariot, chariot race, images. Look at this, same thing, look. It's almost the same thing. Look at these people watching the horses and look at these people watching the cars. It's the same thing. And the Romans started this over 2000 years ago. We're still doing the same thing. All right. And last but not least, we've got law. There are still, let's see here, let me erase that. Law. Okay, so in the very beginning, in the early years of the Roman Empire, the law was not written down. If someone had a dispute, an argument with someone else, they went before a judge and the judge decided what happened. But eventually, in the 400s BCE, the Roman Empire, the rulers of the Roman Empire, wrote down laws. And they were called the 12 tables. And these were laws about family relations, about property, about inheritance, and some other stuff that they thought was important and they needed laws about. And it, so they were written down and strict. If you had a problem with your neighbor, you guys went to a judge and the judge looked at the 12 tables and decided who was right and who was wrong. Well, Ever since then, the 400 BCs, so here's my, let me erase that. Here's my timeline. And there's zero. This is us in 2021. So we have to go back 2021 years and we get to here. Go back again 400 years. And the law, these, the laws that happened, happen now, lots of our laws are still based on these laws that were back, made way back then. They've changed a little bit over time. Certainly some laws have changed, uh, but, uh, but overall, they're still based on those same laws from way back here. And those laws are called civil law. There are some countries in Europe, uh, France, Spain, Italy, that their laws are still, they're called civil law because the laws of their nation are based on these 12 tables. There are some states in the United States that practice civil law. And civil law is based on these 12 tables. Like I said, they're not the exact same anymore. Laws change a little bit, but they're still based at the, the core of their value 
still based on these 12, 12 tables from almost 2,500 years ago. Okay, so this is, you've learned a bit about Roman culture and a bit about how we today still do things that the Romans did thousands of years ago. I'm finished, bye guys. <laughs>